So, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Claudia Phylos. I work with Heroes X in R25. And I'm Elton Barker, I'm at Yoke University, and I'm here representing Classics Confidential. And the boot's on the other foot, because it seems as though I'm being interviewed, yes. rather than being the interviewer, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. We'll see how it goes. So, Elton, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with Pleasure. me today. So, can you just start off by talking a bit about the digital projects that you work on? Because um, I think our community would be very interested in the work that you're doing. Um, and I'll start talking, and then you should interrupt to stop me... No problem. Going off on one, because okay. there are three interlocking okay. projects. So I start off with the Hestia project. This is where things uh, started themselves for me in, the, in this digital world. So mm -hmm. the Hestia project is an investigation in the way in which Herodotus organises space in his narrative. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about Herodotus' histories, Greek historian, um, 5th century BC. He's talking about the conflict between his peoples, the Greeks and the Persians, and in order to explain why it was that these two peoples came into conflict with each other, he goes about their known, their known world and describes it. Mm -hmm. And what we're particularly interested in exploring is the way in which he um, associates places together, how he connects places. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we wanted to do this in order to confront and in many ways challenge the usual dichotomy that people kind of um, build into Herodotus. Mm -hmm. I mean, just what, what do you, what well, do you to think? some extent, it's there in the way he, uh, in, the, in the opening paragraph, where he talks about his peoples, the Greeks versus the, the Persians, the barbarians. Mm -hmm. So you do get a sense of an East versus West clash. Mm -hmm. And that, this, of course, has been hugely influential for uh, the history of ideas ever since. Well, and we're still living with it. Um, but Herodotus himself is much... Uh, much more careful about the way he sets up this opposition. So for sure we end up with this big conflict between the Greeks and the Persians. But as scholars have been recently pointing out, people like Chris Pelling, and I mentioned Chris because he's part of the Hestia project, mm -hmm. the, this idea of the self versus the other, the Greeks versus the barbarians, gets challenged and deconstructed all the way through the narrative. And in particular, in a geographical perspective. So we get right at the beginning... Rather to talk about how the Persians view the world in, in, in particular um, sections and that they're happy with ruling over their section, which is in the east, and the, they understand that Greeks want to rule over their section in the west. But this is put in the mouths of these kind of Persian logoi, these Persian mm -hmm. wise men. And Herodotus himself, it, the way in which he organised his space in his narrative, deconstructs that boundary between mm -hmm. East and West. Um, he, there's, a, there's a famous passage in Book 4 where he talks about these schematic representations of the world and precisely in these kind of big power blocks uh -huh. between Libya, Europe and Asia. And um, he laughs at these representations because they're too schematic. So what's really at the heart of this investigation, what's really at the heart of the Hestia project, is to try to think about the way in which space is represented in narrative. Okay. So, trying to get away from cartographic uh, depictions of space. So, let me give you an example. A clear example of the difference between uh, cartographic visions of space and the way in which we're trying to investigate the way Herodotus organises space in a discursive manner, in his narrative. And this is an example that many people have discussed. Uh, Alex Purvis, for example, yes. uh, in a recent book, Space and Narrative, does a very good job of this. Yes, has you've been... Tweeting about this, I believe, right? Yeah, That's yeah. Right, yes. So Aristagoras, uh, Tyrone and Miletus, comes to Sparta, tries to get the, one of the Spartan kings, Cleomenes, on board with uh, basically a rebellion against the Persians. Mm -hmm. And he comes and he brings with him, in order to persuade Cleomenes, a map, some kind of engraving. Okay. And it, you know, it's the, one of the first examples of a map that we have, um, you know, we could go back to Homer, but let's stay with you artists in a minute. Okay. And the way in which the map is being used is very interesting because it's being used as a tool of persuasion. It's mm -hmm. in order to give Cleomenes the idea that it's actually really easy to go from your power base in Greece here across the sea uh, to Sardis, which is kind of the, the far, furthest east place that the Greeks were very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then by step by step by step, finally you're in Susa, and Susa's got all this stuff that you'd really want. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really nice way in which we see the, um, 
with the use of the map and its pretense that this uh, this conceit that it can represent space accurately, mm -hmm. the collapsing of boundaries and distinctions. And when two things are really interesting. First of all, the immediate context, which you know, the, the story that we have uh, with Aristagoras and Cleomenes. Cleomenes has to go away and think about it. He's Spartan, so he takes a long time to think about these things. <laughs> and he comes back you know, three days later and asks, well, so how far is it by the way, to the to, yeah, to the to this uh, place you talk about, Susa. Oh, well, it's thirty days from the sea. You know, and at this, you know, Cleomenes kicks Sarasagos out because you know, not only are we uh, thinking in terms of a, uh, a Spartan mindset, here, getting to the sea is is far enough, and then what? It's another thirty days on top of that. So already here we get, and this is something that again people have talked about with you others. Well, you get different focalizations, different perspectives. And in this case, you get uh, different perspectives on space. Mm -hmm. Aristagoras from Miletus on that Ionian coastline, centre of this uh, thriving metropolis, looking both east and west, and the centre of all these uh, communication lines. Sparta, way off, mainland Greece, proper Peloponnesus, you know, this almost like an island in and of itself. Thinking about crossing the Aegean Sea, that's a big deal. So you get these conflicting perspectives. So then but, what, but just just to finish, what... The, What's also then really interesting is that after Herodotus gives us this uh, uh, this episode, he then recounts the same space, ostensibly to bear out the fact that, yeah, it is more or less 30 days, it's actually a little bit more, but what's happening, of course, that he gives you, it takes two chapters for Herodotus just to write about this space, he gives you the effort involved. Mm -hmm. you know, it takes this days, and you've got to change wars, then you cross this river, so you get a sense of cartographic, abstract space being being set opposed to a sense of lived space, nice. a sense of space in movement, a sense of space in effort. And that's the key thing that the Hestia Project is all about investigating. Now, how